Ajith Fernando. Ajith Fernando serves as Teaching Director of Youth for Christ in Sri Lanka after being National Director for 35 years. His grassroots ministry has been and is primarily with the urban poor. Ajith has a wider counseling and mentoring ministry with Christian leaders and workers and a teaching ministry in conferences and theological schools in Sri Lanka and abroad. He is also an award-winning author of 16 books and several booklets and articles which have been published in 20 different languages. Let's welcome Ajith Fernando. I'm hoping today to uh, continue with the passage that we started yesterday and uh, speak on what happened after they had been told, after Peter and John had been told, that they cannot preach in the name of Christ anymore. So we come to verse 23 of chapter 4 of Acts. Acts chapter 4 and verse 23. When they were released, they went up to their friends and reported what the chief priests and elders had said to them. We are told they went up to their friends. Actually, this word... Uh, um, refers more to a, like an inner circle of friends. Um, the one translation says they are companions. And I think when we are under attack, when we are living in hostile situations, uh, the, it's so important for us to have friends to whom we can go, who can help us to think right in the midst of all the confusion that, is, that we face. Uh, yeah, yeah, one of the values of Christianity is this idea of close friends. I mean, we have fellowship with the whole body of Christ, but we also need these people, these few people that we can come to, our own people. Uh, that's another translation of this word friend here. Uh, Proverbs 18, 24 says, a man of many companions will come to ruin, but there is a friend who sticks closer than a brother. We need such friends, especially in this Facebook world where the word friend has been inflated, inflation has taken place, and the value of the word friend has gone down, down, down. We need friends like that. Uh, one of the great, we thought, was a great step forward in our ministry was when we had a fairly large evangelistic rally. About 700 people came uh, 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 in a bilingual, a bilingual rally. The, the two races were at war, but we thought we'll have a bilingual rally. And the main feature of that rally was a drama, which was in both languages at the same time and on the, th on the theme of peace. And so we were very pleased with, with this progression in our life uh, as a ministry. When that night after the rally, I got a call around 12 o'clock midnight to say that the person who organized this whole rally, he's our drama person who was doing our drama work, uh, had been arrested for being a terrorist. And so uh, I called uh, a lawyer and uh, we went, it was past midnight when we went to the police station and they chased us out of the place, saying that we are trying to, uh, uh, you know, trying to obstruct justice and uh, interfere. And, um, and this guy went, this was about the 13th time he had been arrested. Uh, and uh, he had been assaulted badly before. And he was very discouraged. He, uh, he was first, uh, usually we go the moment somebody is arrested, because before they go to the remand prison, if we can get them out, uh, then, uh, you know, they don't have to stay in prison. So, but I, we couldn't do that with this person. So we went... And, um, and he went to prison and the news came that he was very discouraged. And then he was sent to another prison where there were about 700 people, 600 people, who were all either convicted or suspected terrorists. And he was in that prison. Again, we heard that he was very discouraged. And then he met another Christian in this prison. And the two of them used to meet to pray and they prayed and God gave them a burden. We must do something here. And uh, little by little, they, they, they first started a prayer meeting and people began to come and it got so big that they had to have two prayer meetings. And this guy was a Youth for Christ worker and most of the people here were young people. So we have our ways of entertaining youth. 
So uh, he started a drama. He, because he was a specialist in drama, he started drama classes. Then most of them had to do uh, government exams. So he started uh, tutorial classes with people who could teach teaching. And we would get the most unusual messages from this prison. Please send us a volleyball or a volleyball net or worship songs. They soon started having um, worship there. And there was a time when there were about 70 people attending worship. And he became the one who was in between the authorities and the prisoners. And God was using him in a ma most unusual way. When we uh, first went, when he, when we had a, when he had a court case, uh, he would, um, uh, we would say, please, 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 Lord, let him be released, let him be released. After some time, when the court case was there, we would pray, if it's your will, Lord, let him be released, because God was using him so powerfully there. Finally, he was released after 15 months with no charges, no no nothing. Uh, and, uh, and when he came back to the prison uh, to, to say that he was released, the prison authorities said, can you stay a short while more? <laughs> because there were some people on the roof uh, protesting about something. And he said, if you can get them down, then you can go. He said, no, I'll go. <laughs> uh, and they told him, you can come back anytime. <laughs> and, uh, and that's what he did. He kept going back and ministering in that prison. He worked with us for about another 15 years. And today he is the national director of Prison Fellowship. Uh, <clears throat> everything changed when he found another Christian friend. So important for us to have friends for our crises. We can get over discouraged. We can get bitter. We can, with hostility, rash, make rash decisions. And, uh, or we can develop this loner mentality of, a, of people who no one understands me and things like that. So, encouragement through friends. Then we come to verse 24. And, uh, and when they heard it, they lifted their voices together and said. Prayer was their foundational response. Prayer is a very important part of Acts. In the first 13 chapters of Acts, which really describes the way the church started off, you find prayer mentioned in every chapter except chapter 5 of Acts. Uh, prayer was the lifeblood of the church. And when there are problems like this, we pray. Um, and, and, you know, living in a country where we've always had turmoil, we have hope and then the hope is gone, more hope, hope is gone. Uh, one of the things that is so difficult to maintain is the momentum of prayer. Because you wonder, is it worth praying? And sometimes when Christians, because we have Christians from both races in our country, and when Christians meet to pray, Sometimes they pray for completely opposite things. One prays for one thing and the other prays for the opposite thing. But they are praying to God. And you know, in, in Romans 8, I, I love this verse, Romans 8, 26 and 27. It says, the Spirit helps us in our weakness. For we do not know what we ought to pray for. But the Spirit intercedes for us with groanings that are too deep for words. We don't know what to pray for. So the Spirit helps us. And then verse 27 says, the Spirit intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. The Spirit takes our prayers and he acts as a divine editor, bringing them in line with the prayers, with the will of God. So we pray not knowing whether what we are praying for is true or whether the other side is praying the truth. But we pray to God with an open heart. And God will change and bring it into line with his will. I, I experienced this when I went to South Africa in the 1980s. I met some wonderful Christians. Uh, the Youth for Christ work there has black and white um, ministry. Uh, they were together. And I met some wonderful people from both races. But as I was uh, listening to some of my friends talking, I thought, I don't think, I mean, they're praying so hard, but I don't know whether what they're praying for is right. Whether they are, uh, you know, they were praying for a military victory and things like that. 
But then came the, you know, the Mandela coming into power and all of that. And I realized how God had answered their prayers. It was not, the answer was not what they asked for. But there was an amazing non-violent change in, in, in power. And I think that was in answer to the prayers of the saints. And so we continue to pray. We may be praying the wrong thing, but as we know, the little we know to be God's will, we pray and God will answer. And it was united prayer. I don't, uh, I'm not going to spend uh, time on this, but uh, problems often um, reveal disunity in a group. This is why you find couples divorcing after a severe sickness of a child. Because during that sickness, their disunity was in, in, in for, full force. Other times, crises force people to get together and bring the, you know, in Sri Lanka, persecution has brought the church together. As nothing has done, in spite of all the preaching and all of that, it was persecution that brought the church together. We realized we had to be together. So they prayed with one mind. Uh, the word here is, uh, it says together, but it's this word homotumadon, which is really with one accord or with one mind. Then, if you look at their prayer, it was a prayer that was reflecting on the sovereignty of God. It said, Sovereign Lord, who made the heaven and the earth and the sea and everything in them. Now here, uh, you, you see how at a time when they were under attack from the authorities, they were addressing the sovereign Lord. This word sovereign Lord is, the, is a translation of one word. It's not the normal word for Lord, kurios. It's the word despotes, which is the word that is used for one who wields absolute power. So they were talking about uh, after the authorities had talked to them and prohibited evangelism. And now they are praying to the Lord of the authorities, the one who wields absolute power. And then they, they go to, um, uh, to uh, uh, the, the Psalms and Psalm 2, and they say, who through the mouth of, your, of our father David, your servant, said by the Holy Spirit, why do the Gentiles rage and the peoples plot in vain? And the kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers were gathered together against the Lord and his anointing, anointed. Why do the Gentiles rage? Uh, it's very interesting, the word rage here is the word that was used for well-fed highly spirited horses. Now they are, they are raging, but they have to submit to the reins of the, of the one who controls the horses. So in the same way, thinking of the sovereignty of God, these people are raging, but ultimately they have to submit to the will of God. And the people's plot in vain, it's an empty plotting because you can't Fight God. And then, of course, the opposition is real. 26, the kings of the earth set themselves against the rulers, uh, against, set themselves, and the rulers were gathered together against the Lord and his anointed. The opposition is real, but God is sovereign. And the safest place to be is with God, the sovereign. Uh, I had a friend, I had a colleague who went to the north uh, just before the st war started. And, um, and things had, had got really bad. You know, we hardly had any, any communication between the north and the south. Uh, and, um, and things were so bad that um, we asked him, you must come back. It's not safe for your children. You need to come back. And he wrote back to us saying, what do you mean come back? How can I come back now? Besides, you say it's not safe. The safest place to be is in the center of God's will. Because if God is sovereign, then the only thing to fear is disobedience. Now the vision of this sovereignty came from the scriptures. And so uh, they, they quote Psalm 2. 
and 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 very often for us that's how the, uh, that that's what puts us on course in the midst of severe crisis and trouble it puts us on course because it it reminds us of what doesn't change we are living in temporary changing difficult circumstances the bible talks about a world a kingdom that is growing it doesn't change and so often in the bible god's people respond to situations by spontaneous uh, recitation of scripture uh, they did that here jonah did that in in the in the belly of the whale uh, mary did that uh, with her wonderful magnificat zechariah did that in luke chapter 1 and so we go to the scriptures uh, in 1989 sri lanka had a terrible revolution in addition to the war uh, it is estimated that maybe 50000 people died in that one year and most of the people who died were young people from the army and from a, from all over young people were dying Uh, there's a city uh, there's a river uh, just outside our city that borders our city and if you went past that river there was never a time when there wasn't a body floating on that river things got really bad people were leaving the country children were not going to school for six months at a time and um, and you know a lot of people left because they said it's because of the children we of course had we were convinced that god had called us to sri lanka and we are not going to leave whatever happens but we had to think of the children and so my wife and i were chatting and we thought well whatever happens outside let's have a happy home for them and 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 that will make it worthwhile that we stayed uh, but i was in such a terrible mood all these young people dying some of the people i had talked to i remember there was a boy i talked to about the lord uh and and he was killed and um, and 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 it wasn't helping the mood of our home one day when i was in my one of my bad moods my wife said something to the children so that i will hear uh, our wives have a way of doing that sometimes <laughs> and uh, and she said father is in a bad mood let's hope he goes and reads his bible You know there is a way in which the scriptures brings us back to our foundation everything around us may be uncertain but the word of god abides forever and it talks about a kingdom that god is building and we are participating in that process so we have courage to go on so then they reflect on what happened to jesus Uh, for truly verse 27 for truly in this city there were gathered together against your holy servant jesus whom you anointed both herod and pontius pilate along with the gentiles and the peoples of israel anybody who was anything had got together against jesus herod pontius pilate the jews the gentiles everyone had got together against jesus but what did they ultimately do verse 28 to do whatever your hand and your plan had predestined to take place the greatest tragedy became the greatest victory the death of christ opened the door for the salvation of the world and that's how the church looked at this setback it looks like a big setback but like that setback resulted in a great victory this too will and that's what the vision of the sovereignty of god does to us we look at everything from the perspective of a god who is working one of our heroes uh, is a lady who's a minister in the south of sri lanka her husband was a monk from the majority religion in sri lanka and um, he was searching for the truth and he got a tract read the tract one thing led to another and he became a christian and god gave him a real burden to reach the lost 
So he went to Bible college and when he finished, he went to a place where there were no Christians, a very difficult place for Christians to work. And, um, and he started preaching. And it was during the time of this revolution that I said in 1989. And people were being killed and they said, oh, it's part of the revolution. So you could murder an enemy and not, no action will be taken. So um, this, pers- this pastor, he had about 35 in the church by now. And the pastor was getting threats. And finally, somebody, uh, two, a few people came. They said, we want to talk to the pastor. Pastor came out. He was playing with his one-year-old child. Pastor came out. They stabbed him. And he ran into the house. And they shot him and killed him. It was one of those sad, sad days in the life of our country. The people told his wife, now this is too dangerous for you. You must go. You cannot stay here. But she said, my husband and I came with a vision. And that vision has not been fulfilled yet. We must stay. So she and the one-year-old son stayed. And um, my wife and I got friendly with them. One day they came home. Uh, She came home. And uh, four years after the husband had died, and we asked her, how are things? And she said, oh, God is blessing. And so we asked, what is it? And she said, oh, this week we had the fourth anniversary of my husband's funeral. So a lot of people came to church. And, uh, and when um, the, they saw so many people in the church, the villagers got agitated, and that night they set fire to the church. And of course the church didn't catch fire, but the roof was a temporary roof made out of coconut leaves. The roof caught fire. So we were wondering how God was blessing. <laughs> and she said, well, God knew that we needed a new roof. So he took the roof away. Uh, What happened was that her denomination, the Assembly of God, uh, sent a message to say that the roof was gone and they raised money. And not only did they build a new roof, they built a bigger church because the church was getting too small for the congregation. And it went on like that. And then the time came, one day after service, the people assaulted everyone who had come for the service. They tore their Bibles and assaulted them. And, um, and then the people said, now it is not good for your son to be here. He's, be- he's been bullied in, in school. And they told her, you better send your son to the city, to Colombo, which she very sadly had to do. And, um, and so she sent him. And then describing this, she said, but praise God. Because my son had lost all his confidence. He was being bullied in school. He went to this Christian school. And he has found his confidence. He's now doing very well. So she was thanking God for the assaults. Well, soon the church, that that church also got too small. So they decided to build a bigger building. And one day, they were in the compound that night, asleep when bombs went off in that compound. And there were about five bombs, I think about three of them went off and damaged the foundation. When I heard about this, I thought I must call her. And I thought I'd tell her, maybe you should be a, go a little slow with the building. But before I could say that, she said, but we will not stop building. <laughs> and, uh, and she said, God gave us this vision and we must continue the vision. And then she told me, after the bomb, the people realized nothing will stop these people. And they are not as bad as we thought they were. We might as well accept them into the community. A few days later, a few maybe months later, uh, the, the temple nearby was dedicating their new hall And so they invited her as a guest. And she was on the platform. And they told her, now you can do whatever you want. And uh, she said, I prayed. And I gave the whole gospel in the prayer. (laughs) And she was thanking God for the bomb. Because the bomb opened the door for their acceptance. 
living under the sovereignty of God. When her husband died, there were about 35 people in that church. Now there are about 10 churches that have started from that one church. Of maybe over a thousand, I don't know how many people, but it's a, it's, a, it's a large group that has come. So we live with a vision of the sovereignty of God. I would like to tell this to my Palestinian brothers and sisters. Don't give up hoping. Don't despair of praying. Be the leaven which leavens the whole lump. Do not do what you need to do to combat the injustice around you. Look forward to his sovereign, to God's sovereign action to bring glory to, uh, to, through, to bring glory to him through your people. So they receive this vision of sovereignty. And, uh, and that is what gives us the strength to obey. Uh, because God is working. We respond to evil by working. So we obey. And that's what they pray about. In verse uh, 20, um, uh, 29, you, after they had reflected on the sovereignty of God, there is only a passing reference to the problem. Now look upon their threats. The rest of it is about obedience. They said, and grant your servants to continue to speak your word with all boldness. They ask for faithfulness, the, the strength to, to be obedient to God. And of course, what they pray for is that they might be effective in evangelism. I'm, I'm rushing through the points. Uh, but they, they pray that they may share the gospel boldly. They are asking for boldness. I think it was about a year ago when there was an attack on a bus of Christians who were going to a shrine uh, in, um, in, um, uh, in Egypt. I don't know whether you remember that. Uh, 30 people died, 26 were wounded. Uh, my friend uh, Ramez Atala gives this report. He's from the Bible Society. He gives this report uh, about what happened after that. Uh, the government minister, a government minister went to a hospital to be with the people who had been injured. They had lost, a lot, lot had died, others were injured. And, um, and there was a woman there among those who was injured, who, um, who told the government minister, don't worry about me. I'm worried about you. I'm worried about where you will go after you die. And the ministry was a bit taken aback, and the people apologized, thinking the woman was too upset and had, you know, was a little deranged. And she said, no, I'm in my right mind. I've lost 11 members of my family, and I have nothing else to lose. But I'm at peace, knowing they are in heaven. What about you? Have you read the Bible? She urged him to read the Bible and to consider his destiny. Even in a time of crisis, she was looking at life with gospel eyes. And that's something that we must do to remember that people need the Lord. I'll never forget the day when I, you know, we had a bomb blast next to my son's school. It was the scariest day of my life. He was slightly injured, uh, but um, uh, it was the scariest day of my life. On Christmas Day, when my colleague was in prison, we took uh, lunch for everybody in the prison. And, uh, and it was a wonderful service. People were thanking God for coming to this prison because in the, go in the prison they had met God and things like that. It was so moving. And then suddenly, somebody told me, that's the guy who masterminded the bombing of the Joint Operations Command, which was the bombing next to my son's school. And here was the man responsible for the, for the scariest day of my life. And they said, he's considering the gospel. And I forgot. I forgot about the bombing. Because here was a person who was loved by God and who needed the gospel and was open 
to the gospel. So we look at people from the perspective of the Great Commission. Then they pray that God will show his power with signs. We looked at that yesterday, so I won't talk about that today. But I'll just uh, go to the last verse that we will look at, which is verse 31. It says, And when they prayed, the, sun, uh, the, the place in which they were gathered together was shaken, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and continued to speak the word of God with boldness. Uh, God, this was a sign of a, like in the Old Testament, of a theophany, when God comes down. Here they were given this scary command, and God has intervened. He has, uh, he has intervened to act on behalf of the people, to give them a sense, I am with you. And this happens often in the life of Paul. Uh, in Acts 18, uh, when he's uh, in Corinth, and he's discouraged after having been rejected from place to place. And he comes with fear and trembling to, uh, to Corinth. And now they also have rejected. The Lord speaks to him in the night and ministers to him. In Jerusalem, after he has gone on this long-awaited visit and they have put him in prison, again the Lord comes to him. After the storm, when he had you know, spent two weeks in a... I can imagine what a difficult situation it was. An angel comes to him and speaks to him. God knows how much we can handle. And he never makes us trouble, suffer more than we can. Uh, I, I talked about this couple who said the safest place to be is in the will of God. Um, once the bombing had got so bad, the house next to their home was bombed. And so they went to a refugee camp. They were, which was really a school. And in the classrooms, there would be about three, or three families, three or four families uh, you know, that were in each classroom. And um, my colleague, being a Christian worker, would, read, uh, would lead the people in worship uh, every evening. And one evening, he asked, are there any requests? And his wife said, I would like an egg for my son. You know, the food was scarce, the child was very small, and she, she said, I would like an egg. And my colleague was very embarrassed uh, because here nobody has uh, eggs. How can I pray for an egg for my child? But the prayer was given in public, so he prayed. Lord, if it is your will, please give us an egg. Uh, that night, the bombing got very close to the camp. And a shell fell on a house of a Christian lawyer just next to the camp. The, fell, uh, the, uh, the, the, uh, the shell fell actually onto a, uh, to a uh, chicken coop that the wife of the lawyer had. And all the, ch uh, the fowls, you know, had flown away or died. Only thing left was one egg. And she said, you know, we can't have this egg. And there is this Youth for Christ worker in the school next door. And they have a little boy. Why don't I go and give it to the mother? So that night they had prayed, Lord, give us an egg. And in the morning, by special delivery, an egg was delivered. God knows how much we can handle. And he will never make us experience more than we can. So let's go to him. Let's be with him. Let's get strength from his word and let's obey him because he's the sovereign Lord. Let's pray. Father, I do not know what situation my brothers and sisters here are in. But I know that all of us at different times of our lives face challenges. Give them such a vision of your sovereignty such a strength from your word that they will obey and see how you turn evil into good. Thank you that you are working. Now help us also to join and do the work you have called us to do. In Jesus' name, amen.